the University of Wollongong. Amy holds her PhD in social welfare. Amy's research contributes to building the evidence base on family support by community organisations working with families of young children and children and youth with disabilities. Her publications include peer-reviewed journal articles on the topics of child abuse prevention, parent peer support, social investment in children and policy advocacy. She is co-author of Six Steps to Successful Child Advocacy, Changing the World for Children and co-editor of Developmental Social Work, Investment Strategies and Professional Practice. Amy taught at San Francisco State University, consulted for a number of organisations to improve their program design, delivery and evaluation, including San Francisco Head Start, San Francisco Department of Public Health, International Children's Resource Institute and the Ministry of Education for Brunei. Uh, Amy is currently conducting studies on peer support and advocacy training for parents of children with additional needs and family support by early childhood educators. Amy began her career as Director of Romanian Children's Relief, where she managed programs supporting orphaned and abandoned children in Romania. The experience left her with a profound appreciation for the importance of the early years and the strong commitment to strengthening families and communities. Welcome, Amy. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Uh, I wanted to thank our organizers for this wonderful conference, and particularly for, uh, to Sasika and to Barbara for the invitation to be here, and also for matching me with a wonderful buddy, uh, with Corey from uh, MacKillop Rural Community Services, who's been so kind and welcoming. Um, and I also am happy uh, to have come after the morning sessions uh, to have heard Heather's presentation on knowledge translation into practice, um, addressing violence against women and children. And also I was at Morag and Tim's presentation about child-centered uh, practice. And I'll talk about a little bit about family-centered practice, but we're really talking about the same thing, so taking care of children by taking care of their families. Um, so I'm here today as a representative of University of Wollongong and our Early Start uh, initiative. So if you want to advance this up. Uh, what I'll talk about today is about the um, Early Start Initiative. I have a short video about it. Um, I particularly want to spread the word because we actually, this initiative is based in Wollongong, but actually we are serving uh, early childhood centers that are even out here in this region. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and then I'm going to just uh, share a couple of examples of my own projects that are in the area of social inclusion to share a little bit about the kind of work that we're doing. Thank you. So first, a little bit about the University of Wollongong Early Start um, Initiative. So it's based in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Wollongong. Um, if you have questions about the, the initiative in general, I just wanted to direct you to some of the key contacts. We have a leadership team that's made up of um, um, Michelle Kellaway, who's the Chief Executive Officer. She particularly looks after the discovery space and community programs. Um, Professor Mark Derone, who is the director, the academic director of Early Start and then Professor Tony Oakley, who's the director of the Research Institute. Um, so if you have any questions, um, again, about the broader mission of Early Start, I would just direct you back to the leadership team. Thank you. So Early Start, have any of you heard about the Early Start initiative? Anybody? Show of hands, a few people, yeah? So it's a, it's a really very exciting thing to be part of. I, you know, I came all the way from San Francisco to be part of this initiative, um, because it really is, um, as the video I'll show you, talks about, a world first program, um, first for Australia, first in the world, to do a lot of the things that we're doing now at the university. So there are different components. Uh, it was the Early Start Initiative was established with funding from the federal government, um, also a private foundation, uh, the Abbott Foundation, Family Foundation, and also the University of Wollongong. And it has different components. So, and you'll see a little bit in this video I'll show, there's a discovery space that's been built at the University of Wollongong. It's been open for more than a year now where we welcome uh, young children and their families into the university to have um, play-based learning experiences. Um, there's also uh, technology that goes out into the community in the engagement centers that allows engagement centers to connect with the university and for the knowledge uh, and research that we have there to be disseminated to the community and for the community to communicate back to us at the university about uh, the needs of communities and children and families and how we can support and work with them. To, to build strong communities and families and children. 
There's also the Early Start Research Institute, um, which I will talk more about as well, that has several different um, foci and around different aspects of research uh, for children and families. Um, we also are doing a lot of innovative teaching and professional learning and development. We're doing uh, a lot of, a lot of that is focused on professionals in the early childhood sector and also in social work, which is my area, which is a new area of teaching for the university. Um, and then the engagement centers, which is a way we're using technology to connect to those engagement centers, to also towards our pro program of larger, broader social change. As you can see, we have a, a beautiful building and we have a beautiful discovery space and we, it's a wonderful way of bringing in children and families again into the university um, and then the engagement centers which allows us to go out into communities. So, uh, so uh, essentially this is uh, the mission. So uh, you know, we're trying to build professional capacity among early childhood educators and related professions. Um, we're working towards building a transdisciplinary research, uh, research institute where we have people in public health and education, social work, um, sociology, criminology, many different fields coming together uh, and disseminating what we're learning um, in the discovery space environment and then also through our relationships with the engagement centers. Uh, and then, okay, thank you, that's great. And actually here at the engagement centers, and just to point out, it's not labeled, but there are some that are in this part uh, of New South Wales. And so um, the Brewarna Aboriginal Integrated Child and Family Center is one of our engagement centers. Uh, the Dubbo West Public Preschool, um, Kulyangara Preschool are some of the ones that are in this area. And so those engagement centers have received a technology package, a uh, smart board, um, and uh, some other materials that will allow them to connect to the university and to use it, um, to use that, that equipment for the children's learning. Um, and so the engagement centers are really predominantly in areas that are uh, low socioeconomic status where there's uh, a high need and so are places where we think we can make a lot of positive impact um, with communities and with families. Um, and, but it's not about trying to impose something, it's really about um, trying to work with, uh, understand first, and that's really where we're at because it's a very new initiative, understand what it is that we can do to support um, the centers and to support the families and children and then deliver really helpful professional development and also doing collaborative research together. Um, so our, our research uh, approach is around building the evidence base uh, and based on what we already know, we, we of course know the importance of early childhood. So we're building upon that um, to, to do research that is responsive to real situations, to build a high standard of evidence um, and to do a lot of really what Heather talked about this morning around doing practice, um, research into practice, doing that dissemination. So doing high quality research and then working with our partners to get that into, um, into communities through professional development um, and through other forms of, of learning and, and implementation. So the different research areas that are part of the Research Institute, we have several that are focused around public, public health and um, physical development. Those include you know, youth sport, physical activity, um, and food and society. We have ones that are around uh, other domains of development, social emotional development, educational development in early childhood. Um, we have um, a focus on learning, design, and technology. And then social inclusion is, is my area of focus and the researchers in that area are really around, are working around um, best supporting families and children um, with, uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds and um, children with um, additional needs just to have the, to be socially included and to have the most um, highest quality of life possible. So. so we have some commissioned research that's uh, been established. Some of you may have heard about this if you're familiar with any of our engagement centers or other, other centers in New South Wales. There's a very large study going on called the FEEL study um, and that's in partnership with Good Start. So this is a very large study that's around improving the quality of early childhood centers um, around um, the social emotional learning of children and their development. Um, and this is some, uh, some news about that, um, about the study uh, that's, that's really around promoting children's learning around Good Start. I also wanted to highlight that um, if you are interested and we would love to have uh, representatives come to our, uh, um, our conference. So we organized a conference, our first inaugural conference was last year. Did anyone attend our conference or hear about the conference? No? 
well, it's not too late because we're doing another one <laughs> next year. And so we will have a, a conference in September of 2017. Um, and we have a stream around social inclusion and others uh, that would be relevant to people here, including growing through relationships. And something important I want to emphasize is that we're, we're inviting academics and researchers, but we also are inviting contributions from practitioners highlighting practice and best practice so that we can learn from both practitioners and from, and from researchers together. So you can have a look at our website. Um, I think we haven't yet released the call for papers, um, but there will be information coming. So if you, if you are interested, you can uh, get onto our, our website and there'll be a, an opportunity to get onto a mailing list about the conference. Uh, and then the discovery space, which was highlighted in the video, um, is a wonderful space for, for children, really just after birth, up to age 12. It's a really about promoting the adult-child relationship. Um, and there are a lot of unique opportunities there. You may have seen, there's one where there's a, um, you travel through a tummy <laughs> and you come out the other end <laughs> uh, and children love that. Yeah, so it's a way for them to learn about their bodies. There is a, a ship that's been a pirate ship and now it's more of a cruise ship. And so we, the uh, exhibitions get changed quite frequently. There are other ones where there's um, a shopping center you may have seen in the video where children can learn about healthy food and can be the cashier and you know sell things and learn about maths. Uh, so lots of wonderful opportunities for children to learn. And they're all designed to be learning with adults. Um, so the spaces can accommodate both children and adults um, to engage them together. And something that's we, that we like to see is that you know, people are there and they are really engaging with their children. They're not sort of hanging back and on their phones as we all <laughs> like to do sometimes. They're really getting in there and learning with their children. So that's the way the space is designed. Um, there's been more than 100,000 visitors now, and it's, uh, we had the first year uh, anniversary since the center was opened recently. So it's, it's getting a great uptake. Um, so if you are coming through uh, Wollongong, I hope that you'll come by or, or mention this resource to colleagues who are there and to, and to friends. Thank you. Uh, and there's also research that's being done on the Early Start Discovery space. So research about how exhibits are used um, and how learning can, can occur uh, using the environments that we have there. Thank you. So now I'm just going to focus a little bit about social inclusion. I'll just share a little bit about two of my projects um, and how we're doing research and trying to translate that into changes uh, in practice. Okay. So the first project that I'll, I'll talk about is called The Parent Room. Uh, this project is about empowering children and cares of children with additional needs through a peer support and advocacy training intervention. Um, and I'm doing this project together with colleagues in special education, so Dr. Amanda Webster and Dr. Jane Warren, who's in early childhood education, and Dr. Claire Manning, who has a, a, her degree in education as well. And we have project partners, uh, Care South, um, and also Noah Shulhaven. So we're running uh, the program in the Shulhaven and also um, in Wollongong near the Discovery Space. And oh, one more thing, important thing. <laughs> uh, it's been funded through, um, through FACTS. And so uh, we got special permission um, to use some funding um, that had been awarded to Care South uh, through the Aging and Disability Home Care Acquittal Funding to trial this program. Um, and for that reason, in, in part, we are making the training available for free. So I want to come back to that. that there, there's a resource that we're finalizing now that is available uh, to community agencies. Thank you. So the, the background for this particular study, of course, everyone is talking about the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Organizations are getting ready for it. Um, and we know that there's going to be um, a big role for parents in terms of managing their children's services, selecting those services, um, getting access to services, dealing with barriers to services. Um, so we want to prepare families. And we also know that the, the service model is changing somewhat. So where services in the past may have been delivered in a more segregated way, there's a trend towards more uh, delivery of services directly in the community or in the, parent, in the children's homes or in uh, preschools. So there's less opportunity for parents and carers to connect with each other if it's a less segregated service. This is something that Noah Shulhaven has highlighted to us. Parents used to come to them in the past, but now they have a program called Kids Together where they go out and deliver early intervention in local preschools that the children go to. And the parents will maybe miss the opportunity to connect with each other, which has been so important because they were going to one service. Um, and we also want to get parents ready for the roles that they will have as advocates under NDIS. So, so one aspect of this project is around advocating for children. So there's different processes that are involved around advocating for children. This is just a general process. Um, but there, and we sort of tailored this more to, to the role of parents. But we're trying to prepare parents around things like um, 
How do you how do you provide evidence in support of what you, what your child needs? What does your child need? What is the vision for your child? How do you have meetings with people? How do you present things in a way that's assertive, not aggressive or passive? Um, so, and how can you take care of yourself as well? So, we're looking at all these aspects of being an advocate for your child to get to the vision that you want for your child. And the other thing that we're doing in this program is trying to connect parents and carers with others that are also parenting children uh, with additional needs. So we know from the research on peer support that parents and carers derive a lot from being connected with each other. They have that experience, the 24-7 lived experience of parenting a child with additional needs, so they know what it's like, uh, they can relate, they know information that can be helpful to each other, so they may have tried a service or um, you know, have certain techniques and strategies they can share with each other. So it's been important for us to get connect families together um, so that they, they can themselves feel um, you know, more competent, see that someone else is doing it and therefore I can do it, uh, feel empowered that they can take on this role as an advocate for their children, uh, and feel the reassurance that, again, they can do it and that they've got some support. So right now we're running a, a trial for this advocacy training program in two sites. The one is in Shoalhaven with 12 parents and in Wollongong with eight parents. So it's quite small, but we're, um, we're, we're developing this curriculum. Um, and every week, uh, we're in week seven now, parents and carers have come together with us uh, to learn about different aspects of how to advocate for their uh, children. And the program um, in Wollongong has people who are also uh, foster carers and also are involved in the Brighter Futures program. So who are, have involvement with facts and also have a child with additional needs. So this is what our, our program looks like. So the, the first week was really around creating a vision for, uh, for one's child. Um, and then something about introduction to advocacy. And all along, all throughout the weeks, we're trying to sort of feed drip information about the NDIS so it's not too overwhelming. Uh, Wollongong and the Illawarra is, is still a ways out. We're not getting the NDIS until 2017. So we're preparing parents and carers, but we're not, they're not quite there yet, having to do it. Um, so we move from vision to identifying the child's needs and looking at what advocacy looks, looks like. Um, then different methods that they can use in advocacy and the different contexts in which they may have to advocate for their children. That includes in medical and funding environments, in education and community, and using strategies like how do you communicate with others, how do you have meetings, um, and how do you talk to people in the community when they make uh, unpleasant comments about your child? Or how can you educate others so they have a better awareness of your child's needs, such as autism? There's a lot of judgment that's out there. So, um, so we talk about how to handle that personally as, as a parent or care. And also if there's a way of doing some constructive, constructive public education around these issues. Um, and then the parents, are put, they put together a plan of action. And this is a plan of action that is compatible with the planning that they'll do for NDIS. So they'll be prepared, they can go in, or they'll at least know the process because their children's needs will change by the time NDIS comes. But they'll know how to develop a plan for the NDIS and they put that together. Um, and then, and then this, this week, in week seven, we've talked about also how do you take care of yourself? How do you find networks for yourself? Um, how do you look after yourself? And how is respite going to be handled under NDIS? Uh, what are the different ways to get creative with, with respite? And then in week eight, as we finish the pilot, we'll review, they'll have a plan of action to take with them. They have a resource binder of materials that they can go back to. Um, and again, we'll highlight some different aspects of, of the NDIS and celebrate their success. And their dedication to their children that's made them take this time out of their lives for the last eight weeks to, to think about how to best advocate for their children. So again, this, this curriculum that we're developing um, will be made available for free to organizations. Just, it's not up on a website, you'll have to contact me and, and so we can track where it's going. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it'll be uh, free um, once it's available. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And the way that we've developed this program model is really to start with talking to parents and carers about what are your challenges when you do advocate for your child? What settings do you encounter that you have to advocate for your child? So we, we started by talking to parents, doing focus groups with parents and carers, and then also looking at the literature on advocacy training, how best to prepare parents for that role. And then the research we're doing on the training curriculum is to look at, after going through a program like this, um, do parents report differences using measures, uh, standardized measures around empowerment um, and stress and coping? And then also, do they report different levels of knowledge and skills related to advocacy? And 
do they, do they use more services? So we're looking at this in different ways, getting them to do surveys, getting them to do scenarios. So what would you do in this situation, at the beginning and in the end, to see if they would change what they would do, something more that might be more effective? And we're having uh, professionals in the disability sector rate those scenarios to see, oh yes, that blinded to whether this is point one, point, you know, point A or point B, is this a more effective strategy to, to get the child's needs met? And when we're measuring empowerment, we're really looking at some underlying constructs related to empowerment, which are around self-efficacy, so the feeling that, you know, that I can do this, um, and a feeling of competence, again, that I have the knowledge and the ability to do this, um, having knowledge, and then also whether they feel like they're wanting to contribute to some kind of bigger change as well. So we're looking at empowerment as the overall concept, but really these underlying concepts that make up empowerment. And it's, at this point, we're just, this is a pilot, and we're just sort of trialing to see, but, you know, just the point, so before it started and the end, the baseline and um, post-training, um, is there seem to be a change in terms of uh, using these standard measures, uh, the survey, using um, an advocacy scenario, and then interviews. Um, and then we also will, we're hoping to follow the parents over time to learn about their advocacy experiences and see if they put these outcome, uh, these things they've learned into use. So our hope is that we'll have this, this training, that people will take it up. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm here today is to say that this resource does exist. It's, it's available and it will be available for free. One thing that we've learned with the trial is that with Care South, we've had uh, family support workers coming uh, with the parents who are um, in the Brighter Futures program. And the, the support workers have said they've learned a lot about the NDIS by participating in the program themselves. So it can also be a resource to train family workers, for example, so that they can go out and talk to parents as well. So we've been delivering it, intending it for parents and carers, but it also is helpful for staff, uh, to educate staff, so that they can go out and educate parents and carers. And we're hoping that uh, the program can be used, sometimes parents and carers aren't able to come every week for eight weeks for two hours, um, but maybe taking a piece of the program and doing it on a monthly basis in a supportive playgroup, for example. So this month, let's look at your child's needs. This month, let's look at how does it work to advocate in community settings when people make comments. This week, let's look at education and your rights within education. And what we're hoping to do in the long term is really the opportunity that's presented with NDIS is to see how does this work when the, the environment changes and, and parents are in this role and carers advocating for their children? So can we actually follow parents and carers over time and see how are they put into the role of advocates? Where do they struggle? What support do they need? What new information do they need? So that we can continue to feed that back into the curriculum. So that's one project. Uh, and again, there's a resource that's available there. And my email will be at the end. Um, the second project is around, um, it's called Starting Strong, about making children resilient in early childhood. And this is a project I'm doing with Professor Iram Siraj, who's at the University College London, and is also on secondment to us uh, at the University of Wollongong with our research uh, associate colleague, uh, Tony Latham. And our project partner is a, a large regional provider of early childhood services, Big Fat Smile, which has been around for, um, since 1981. And they offer 27 community preschools and early childhood long day care centers. Um, and they're our partner on this project. Thank you. So again, something that everyone that knows in terms of background is that early childhood uh, education and care environments can improve children's developmental trajectories. And the research shows this is very much the case, particularly for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. But we know that you know, children are in early childhood care and education for a short period of time. They're with their parents for the long haul. And so there's this opportunity with early childhood environments to plant a seed to support families in a way that can make the gains from early childhood um, education and care more long lasting for children's lives. So we're looking at how can that be done in terms of supporting families essentially uh, through the early childhood environment. And we think that family centered practice is a way of doing this. And it's really related to family resilience and uh, to the bioecological model as well. So resilience you know, is about really just um, helping parents and helping families to respond to pressures and strains. I mean, this is why we're here today. We all know about this. Um, and it's about becoming stronger from that experience. Um, so it's about children having, becoming more resilient, and it's about their families becoming more resilient. And then also the bioecological model, which came up you know, in, in the presentation with Tim, um, that it's 
children are nested in different environments, and so early childhood education and care is one environment, the family is another environment. So how do these environments come together to support children and to support families? So what we, the way we started was just a very sort of simple exploratory study just to see what the, what the teachers in this service were doing now in terms of supporting families and to build resilience among children and among, and among families. So we started by just doing an observational study in one preschool within this network of this provider to see what was being done and then also talking to directors and to teachers um, and to the key administrators about how do they think about building children's resilience and families' resilience, what are they doing now, and how can we build upon that to make it even stronger and more robust. So what we heard in terms of what educators already do, they talked about uh, really focusing on children's social and emotional resilience. So they do things like provide, a, particularly for children from disadvantaged backgrounds, provide a home-like environment that's really comfortable to children, where they feel good um, and they feel safe. They provide consistent and pre predictable routines for children, which is so important, particularly for children who have a more chaotic home environment. They come in to the early childhood education and care center, they know what to expect, they feel safe, it feels comfortable. Um, they have relationships that are really built on trust and again, consistency. Um, and they, they do work to build children's self-esteem. So one of the directors said how she likes to make children feel like hot shit. <laughs> Just really make them feel good, that's what she wants. That's her goal as an educator, is that they all feel really good about themselves. Um, and to nurture children uh, when it was necessary. So when children did come in and they hadn't eaten or they were, um, needed a wash just to take care of that in a, in a way that wasn't embarrassing to the children. And so one of the educators and the director talked about having a child who came in um, who had been se se you know, severely neglected and um, basically in the six month period that giving this child new clothes and uh, really teaching her how to eat properly, they, they made huge gains. You know? Of course, they also worked with the local, um, with, with facts and talking about this family, but there were things that they could do for the family and to support that child in the center, and they did those things, you know, not just report on a family, they also worked with the child and the family to build the strength in that child and in that family. Uh, the teachers also talked about supporting children's cognitive resilience. So it's not just about the social and emotional aspects of development, but helping children as learners uh, feel good about themselves as learners. Um, and, and sometimes that meant if they hadn't been getting a, a rich home learning environment, adjusting the learning environment to where they were at in terms of their cognitive development. So um, in a room that was a toddler preschool room, they would sometimes bring in materials that were more appropriate for, that would have been used for infants because children hadn't had those early exposures. Um, and also to group children into smaller groups, so again, for that feeling of more um, personalized attention and a bit calmer for them, that works really well. So a, a director commented that when she broke the kids into smaller groups, she really could see what they could do because um, they weren't as overwhelmed by their environments. And then we asked us about supporting parents and what, what teachers and directors currently do around that. Um, and Teachers and educators are, and directors are in this position where they see parents every day. They see them at drop off, they see them at pickup. So they have this opportunity to have this everyday communication and relationship with parents and the carers. And they talked about having those kinds of relationships, um, communicating about the child, and um, building comfort through those regular communications so that if there had an issue had to come up, there was a regular relationship and communication there that supported having harder conversations. Um, and actually this was a quote from a, a parent. So we also interviewed parents for this project to find out how they felt supported by the center. You know, and a parent said that you know, she was living in a neighborhood where she didn't feel safe, she didn't feel comfortable talking to her neighbors, but that she talked every day to the teachers in the uh, early childhood center and she felt good about them. They made her feel good about herself. They gave her confidence. They supported her when she tried for a job. She didn't get it, but they were very reassuring. And that she also had somebody to talk to about her child. And that, that really made an impact about uh, how she saw her child, things she tried in her parenting, um, and even gave her more space of things to talk about with her child, because she knew what was happening in her child's day. So she engaged more at home talking to her child, rather than just sort of disengaging and, and doing the household work or letting him watch television. The relationship she had with the teachers, where she was communicating with them regularly, strengthened her relationship with her child as well. So, but the educators also talked about challenges that they encountered working with uh, with disadvantaged uh, families, and that included 
when children had behaviors that were difficult to manage and they were often trauma-related behaviors, how to deal with those behaviors in a way that wasn't just reactive and punishing to the child. Managing the, the challenging feelings that they, they had around the, what might have been perceived as lifestyle choices around uh, drug use you know, by the parents. Um, when that educator had such a close relationship with the child and knew what that was doing to the child, it was very hard for educators to manage. Um, and then, again, this is a feeling of frustration where they, where they would note things where the parents could be doing with the child um, and may have perceived that parents were unwilling to try something rather than maybe didn't have the capacity to engage in some kind of support strategy within the home environment. Um, and they also expressed a lack of understanding. So these are in, early, in their education as early childhood providers, they hadn't learned a lot about risk factors and about parents. Um, and so that just was a, a gap in their understanding that they mentioned. Um, and how to deal with difficult issues when they did come up. So there was a lot around, is this my role? And I'm not a social worker, so, but, I, but the role of an early childhood teacher, often these issues come up anyway. Um, and then also how to work in collaboration with, um, with child protective services and with the broader environment, broader community. So is, is the responsibility just to report um, what else is out there in the community they can connect families with? Um, so the, the teachers sort of struggled around that as well. So what we are putting into place now with this organization is a shift from family-centered, child-centered to family-centered, but it's really not changing the focus away from the child, it's just broadening out in terms of the ecological model saying, children need their families to be strong to take care of them. So in a child-centered service like early childhood education and care, what can we do to broaden out a little bit to support the needs of, of families as well? So we are, um, we are finalizing a training that will be delivered <clears throat> to the, this provider uh, in, our, in our community um, and also to it will be made available for our engagement centers um, so that there can be more, more education around the needs of families, the risk factors, and how to support families. And this draws on particularly the, um, the strengthening families model from the Center for Social Policy in the US, which is, identifies that there's some different program strategies that early childhood education and care centers can put into place. Um, those include ways they can connect parents and carers to each other to facilitate that kind of mutual support. Um, how so there's strategies for, for strengthening families, strategies for responding to families in crisis, ways they can know about the services that are in their communities and link uh, families to those services. Um, just having that feeling that of valuing and supporting families, um, facilitating children's development as part of um, strengthening families, and then also when there are early signs of abuse and neglect, what are the things that early childhood educators can do still within the purview of their role as an educator, not as a social worker, um, but what are those ways where it's still a, a, a low level of issues and probably won't get a response in terms of the child protective system, so what can be done in that environment? And so there's different protective factors that can be built by using those strategies, building parental resilience, building social connections, building parents' knowledge of parenting and child development, um, providing some kind of concrete support. You know, here is, here's a source for um, food you know, in, the, in the community, clothing, other, other concrete needs, um, and then building the social and emotional and cognitive and language competence of children, ultimately for the good of children and for their families. So we're finalizing this training, and then our, 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 our next steps are around institutionalizing this, so bringing it up out to scale for this particular organization. So doing a training, but building capacity with an organization so that they can do this on an ongoing basis. And so those are the, those are the projects. That's early start. Um, I'm happy to address any comments and questions. I'm, I just got the warning anyway, so <laughs> is there a good timing? Um, so are there any comments or questions? I'm happy to, to address those. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a comment that quite often over the last couple of days um, we've spoken about um, advocating for our children and giving parents the tools to advocate for their children. So, you know, when you talk about that in, within this program, I, I think that is 
really amazing and, and I think it's it's a step in the right direction. Great. Well, please write down my email address. It's hard to read, but um, and I'll, I can email you those materials because I think it is like I'll just tell a quick story about about one parent because some of the frustration that came up for parents, I mentioned some stories around. Like one piece around advocacy is sometimes people say very hurtful things in the community about th their children. So this parent who, uh, with a uh, child with autism was getting very angry with a neighbor who was saying sort of terrible things about his child and he hit him in the head with a brick. <laughs> so you know, then, we, then we did an exercise around like what are communication styles and being aggressive, you know, assertive and passive. So I don't know that he got to the point where he'd be assertive, but how it's, it can be ineffectual to be really aggressive to try to get your child's needs met although it's, it is very emotional when you feel like your child's needs are being overlooked or your child is being labeled, but how can you, for the good of your child, put yourself into the place of you know, coming back a little bit, not sort of the aggressive where it's like, or the passive where you're really leaning back, where you can just sort of be firm and use your passion to drive what you're asking for, but not in an emotional way. So um, I think parents do need these, these skills, this knowledge. All parents have to be advocates for their children. But you know, as the parents in our program are telling us, parents of children with additional needs, they have to do it more often. They have to do it more strongly. It's not a role they ask for, but it's a role that they get pushed into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to support them in doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. just, just a comment, more than a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited to see that mm -hmm. those gaps have been identified mm -hmm. working in the early childhood industry. Mm -hmm. We know we had a conversation on the way here mm -hmm. around that gap of knowledge and, and where to go and what to do. So mm -hmm. congratulations Great. on closing that gap. Thank you. Yeah. I look forward to seeing more of this stuff. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we, we see that. So that's the nice thing about Early Start that brings together people from different fields. So um, Professor Iram Siraj is a world expert in early childhood education. Um, I'm in, in social work and our research associate has this unique background of having worked in facts as a um, doing child protection and having been a director of an early childhood center. So she knows from being at the coalface of both systems that there, you know, there isn't enough bringing those together because early childhood can be a protective environment for children, can strengthen families, but so often it doesn't. That's just like a missed opportunity. So we want to be able to, to strengthen services so they can do more of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Amy, I just actually want to make a comment as well and a thank you for involving communities like Dubbo and yeah. Warrena mm -hmm. in your work. Mm -hmm. I think it makes for a much more comprehensive understanding of what really is happening with our children. I think that is a really exciting thing about the Early Start initiative. So that's something that it's still very early. You know, we still want to do a lot more. You know, so I think everybody, people want sort of a big delivery right up front, but it's going to be somewhat gradual probably. But as, as the knowledge base is building, as, as the resources are building, such as the training that we're developing um, around family-centered practice, we'll have more to offer in communities and to engagement centers. Going, going, going. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And the judges would also say a very sincere thank you for coming from Wollongong and if you would accept this little taken of our appreciation. Thank you. Appreciation. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you.